Right. Tom Lechner, did you title your presentation just laid out? Yeah. I mean, nothing else for us, huh? You know, last night I was thinking I probably should have put more in the title than just the name because it doesn't really mean anything to anyone. <laughs> well, it will. It will next, after this talk. After the this people talk, in this it will. room. So thank you very much, everybody. Reach out to us if you need anything. Tom Lechner and laid out. Well, good morning. Thank you all for coming to the first talk of the day. Or if you end up like falling asleep or something, opting for open sores, open snores instead of open source. I won't be hurt. But anyway, so this talk is about laid out. It's a tool that I've made over the last 10 years or so to help me make my artwork in various ways. Uh, it's basically open source desktop publishing. Uh, I started it, or it's a little bit about me. I, I've done a lot of comics and all kinds of different artwork, photography, photo manipulation. Uh, these were all done in GIMP, by the way, these two things. Like this is a step up transformer, for instance. Uh, I started doing open source uh, graphics work maybe 15 years ago, started using GIMP. Uh, I, got, I was on Windows at the time, and I kept getting viruses. I, I heard these rumors that Linux was, you didn't have to worry about that. So I got a disk from the library and switched and never looked back. Uh, open source graphics software always has little quirks you kind of have to work around sometimes, like anything really. Uh, but it also allows you to adapt things, uh, adapt to your particular circumstances. It helps if you know how to program, which I, I did, so it helps quite a lot. Uh, so this is an, a, a page from one of my comics. I used to make uh, all of my comic books, uh, like little things like this, uh, all homemade stuff. Uh, this, for instance, is made out of tabloid-sized paper, uh, which is cut twice and then folded down the middle. This one's perfect bound to uh, but it's still basically just photocopied, chopping up, and folding paper. And uh, 10 years ago, and to some extent today, there are not many options in open source stuff to keep track of those things. Uh, here's me in my natural habitat with lots of weird books, trying to sell weird books. Uh, so I used to just uh, take a sheet of paper, then write down where pages are supposed to go. Uh, and then like you draw little thumbnails and rearrange little thumbnails, and it takes forever to do that. So computers are supposed to be good at uh, figuring out all the little tedious stuff. So I thought, okay, this can't be so hard. Uh, I shouldn't be wasting so much time doing this. Uh, so I started uh, trying to figure out different ways to lay stuff out, use different little programs. Uh, a lot of designers, uh, this is kind of the environment that it looks like. You don't really need that apple down there, but a lot of designers think that's, that it's necessary, but you don't really need it. Let's see, so I'll first demonstrate kind of how I would make a book now. Um, so with comics, I draw all my own text, so text has never been a big priority for me, which is kind of a detriment to my software, I think. <laughs> but uh, for making comic books, it's not so bad, because it's just a bunch of images. So the task at hand, you have a bunch of images, and you want to lay it out into a book with the minimum amount of effort. Um, so to do that, I can edit the imposition. So right now, this is a letter-sized piece of paper. And to make something like this, for instance, I want to use a tabloid-sized piece of paper. Um, so if I take tabloid size, and right now, this red line is where you cut things. Uh, you can change how many cuts you want, either horizontally or vertically. Uh, and the folds, you can have any number of folds. Uh, just, let's see, for a booklet, it's pretty simple just to do, make one fold down the middle, and then to, to define the folds, all you have to do is drag the paper across, and the computer keeps track of all the folding and stacking everything. Uh, so right now, it's just one sheet of paper folded. Uh, then you can define how many sheets go into that one fold. Uh, this doodad down here uh, lets you define different signatures. If you have different sized signatures, they're called. If you look at a hardbound book, uh, it's basically hardbound books are made by taking giant sheets of paper, printing stuff on it, then folding it, cutting it, trimming it. So you get these packets of stuff. And it's just a big stack of packets all put up next to each other, and then a binding. So each one of these things corresponds to one of those packets. So it's super easy just to add new ones or add inserts. Uh, it's very adaptable to, to different circumstances. 
the simplest one is just a, a booklet like this. Then uh, another important thing for laying out stuff is putting margins. So you can adjust margins just by dragging sliders around. Uh, I really hate like little boxes off to the side because here you are working on something. You don't really want to have to go way over here to like tinker with little numbers and stuff and then go way back and, and go back to what you're working on. It's better to try to concentrate everything you're doing all in where you're actually doing it. And this green bar is for binding. So if you want to make like vertically folding calendars, it's very easy to adjust or right to left books instead of the other way. Let's see left to right or right to left. Let's see. So right now, so that's a booklet. It has margin areas, and I think that's okay. So now uh, you can view the pages now as sheets that you would send to the printer or as single pages, or as how things are going to look uh, as you're flipping through it. So once you have your, your page layout set up, then uh, all you need to do is import, like do a mass import of images, which often is pretty difficult to do in software. Uh, like Scribus, for instance, there's a plugin you can use, but it's not terribly adaptable. Uh, when I first started laid out, I tried to use Scribus to do stuff, but uh, it would frequently crash. And uh, I could do Python plugins, but it's like several steps removed from actually working on stuff. So that kind of helped me, like pushed me into trying to make my own stuff. Scribus is much smoother now, but it's, it still has like lots of modal dialogues. And I, I like the, the handle approach. So when you're doing a mass import, uh, there's various options for what to do with all these images as you're importing it, like set the DPI, have uh, one per page or two per page, or as many as will fit, or all on one page. For comics, basically you're taking one image per page. Uh, so if I do that, if I scale up and scale down, uh, no matter how big the image is, it'll scale it and fit it into that margin area that we just defined. So let's see if this works. So now on each page, uh, there's one image per page. It's all relatively nicely set in the margins. Then you can preview how the pages will look, the things that you take to the printer. Uh, so th that's especially useful if you want to have all color on only one page. Then you can just make sure before actually sending it off somewhere that it's what you actually want. And uh, also, uh, working on uh, books, uh, there's other things like page markers. So if you're working on a page and it's, there's some problem with it that you need to address later, then you can like, diff set up different markers and, and things. Uh, and there's also, if I can remember the like, shortcuts. Uh, the spread editor, what I used to do, just drawing little thumbnails on paper, which took a lot of time. This is basically a direct simulation of that. Uh, so you can uh, move things around, uh, swap pages back and forth. And when you're happy with the layout, then you can apply it. So it's very easy to do. Uh, what used to take me, like a book like this, which is about 100 pages, this would probably take me a few days of, of cutting things out and stapling and like pasting and white out. It, it just took forever. And now it would take like a few minutes. So it's, it, it's a huge time saver. So that was the first uh, real use of laid out. Then once I got basically a working platform, I, I had this thing that's very easy. I, I intimately understood the entire code base. So uh, it sort of has become an experimental playground for various uh, graphics tools. Uh, so let's see. So I, oh, here's an example of the best interface in the world, just a blank piece of paper. There's infinite possibilities. You could do anything you want with it, crinkle it up if you hate it, uh, paint it, rip it, in, rip it in shreds. You can do all kinds of stuff with it that you can't really do so easily with computers. Uh, there's different approaches to to making tools. Uh, like if you're an artist, you tend to like throw stuff around and like mix things up in inappropriate ways uh, or difficult ways. And if you're a programmer, you'd, you don't really care so much about the visual, uh, or at least the stuff that you're dealing with all the time just kind of looks like this. So a, a lot of my tools try to take uh, one or the other and simplify it or kind of bring them together in a way. Um, so here's some, some various stuff that laid out can do. Let's see, which I'll try to demonstrate. 
I forgot to install color fonts before I came here. So uh, one thing laid out can do that. As far as I know, no other open source software can do automatically is uh, layered color fonts. Uh, I'm still working on an open type version. Uh, open type can have colored letters all in one font file. But uh, these color fonts, it's each color is one layer of font. Uh, but you can edit it as text. And all along, I've used other, other software like Inkscape and Scribus and GIMP and, and Krita and various things. Uh, one thing that talks to my programming background in Inkscape is the clone Tyler. It's kind of an obscure feature that lets you clone things in like SRS patterns, except it's extremely difficult to use. Uh, it's like you have to understand these little numbers and how they, how they repeat patterns. Um, so I worked on this interface. Uh, I have vague plans to make it somehow accessible in Inkscape. Uh, I'd like to have some plugin system across all software so that you can use different interfaces. Like if you find one interface that works really well, uh, you should be able to use that interface in different software relatively easily. But that's not an easy problem. Uh, so this, for instance, is a, is a tiling tool. So it's very easy to set up a, a, a cloning area and then repeat things. So this is just a, just a wallpaper group, it's called. But there's all kinds of other ways to arrange things. So like repeating things up and down or uh, flipping around. So it's a very visual way to adjust uh, visual data without a lot of fuss with little numbers in obscure boxes. And it's all real time. And uh, you can also export these patterns into Inkscape and then edit it there. Uh, and it'll work with paths or images or anything else. trying to edit the path. I haven't worked on this tool in, in a little while, so I've, I sometimes forget my own shortcuts for, for doing things. Oh, and now it's not in the tool yet. So this makes it really easy to set up uh, patterns that are cloning in weird ways and then adjust the, the little handles to get shapes just the way you want. So another tool that I, I was working on to do various layout features is how to arrange things. Uh, a lot of times uh, you're only limi limited, you're limited to doing only uh, aligning to bottoms or centers or middles, uh, and it seems very restrictive to do that. Well, that's a little odd. Why is that doing that? Let's 
So I made this tool, which is a, an aligner, uh, just a bunch of little visual things that you can drag around to align in all kinds of various ways. Like, it, like this pulls everything down to a line, uh, just vertically from where they are originally. Uh, or you can s make them arrange all kind of back to back. You can also edit the path that they fall on. So now it'll just pull things right to where you kind of want to lay things out. Or you can adjust the, the layout or the orientation of images that you pull onto. Let's see, you can also, there's also the uh, just different, the standard presets left, right, center, uh, but you're not restricted just to left, right, or center. You can do anything in between, which is potentially adaptable to animation and stuff like that. You can't actually do full-fledged animation and laid out, but it's like one of my, my lengthy to-do things, things that would be fun to do. As time goes on, more and more designers do web stuff that requires animation. So having tools that are able to do that is, just becomes more relevant as time goes on. Let's see some other stuff. Uh, as I got more into programming laid out, uh, I was spending more and more time programming and working out weird tools and less and less time actually making artwork. <laughs> so I thought, okay, well, how can I fix this? Uh, a lot of my artwork is like a lot of cross-hatching, which takes forever to actually do. So I thought, okay, what if I made a tool that uh, lets, me, uh, lets me do some cross-hatching more quickly? So I spent like a couple of years making this tool so that I could theoretically draw faster. Uh, not sure it's really worked out quite that way, but it's been fun to work on this tool. <laughs> so I will demonstrate that here. Uh, and it's, it's mesh-based. So you set up regions where you have just like masses of lines. You can stretch things around, uh, make things bigger or softer. It's the brush resizing uh, just with modifiers. Like you hold down shift, and you can change uh, how much it changes the stuff underneath it. Or you can do block out to remove areas. Oops, that's not the block out, that's the, the shift. Another pinch and pull. More noise. One problem with computers trying to do things to make, uh, act, like, speed up art production is that computers make things way too smooth. So it's important to have, like, fake humanness <laughs> added into it. And there's also a, this is a Buren tool. Like, if you were to do an actual engraving, there's a tool that's just like a, that looks kind of like that. There's a knob just connected to a rod of metal that's, like, really sharp, and you dig into metal with it. Uh, so I've appropriated that imagery to uh, set up ordinary lines. Uh, so again, uh, using just simple visual doodads to control different aspects of things. And there's different kinds of base lines too. Another important aspect of cross-hatching illustration is that you want to be able to dash lines, uh, and you want to be able to control that in various ways. Uh, so like, for instance, uh, if you get really thin, you want to dash it out. Uh, you might want to randomize the length of the dashes or, or uh, taper 
how thick the dashes are. If you're using an engraving machine, for instance, uh, the machine can only go to a minimum width, so you might want to set that minimum width to something, uh, or set the density of the gaps in your lines. Uh, and all of these settings can be shared with layered groups of lines as well. So like if you take one, So now those dash settings are shared between two different line groups. So theoretically, this should make me like make actual artwork faster, but uh, it's it's so much fun to like figure out the problems of doing these things. Uh, so the balance kind of goes back and forth. Like sometimes I'll just make artwork and not program, and then two months later I'll have forgotten all the programming that I did, and I have to relearn it. And then I'll kind of go back and then make more artwork instead of programming. It just kind of goes back and forth. It's that's good for in terms of documenting code. A lot of open source projects, the documentation in the source code is really terrible. <laughs> so if you try to figure out how Inkscape works or GIMP, for instance, there's not a lot of documentation there. And every time I've dug in. I tend to run into a wall, uh, whereas uh, with my stuff, there's copious documentation because since I abandoned it like for a few months at a time, uh, if I don't document things for myself, I'll forget what I did a couple of months ago. <laughs> so it's it's helpful to to kind of be project based like that, kind of fluctuate between art and programming. Let's see what else can I show. And uh, even though I draw most of my own text for cartooning, uh, people often ask for text tools. Uh, so I took a stab at making some minimal text tools. Uh, like right now, the default text at the moment is like really small. Uh, so when you start typing stuff, it's really small. Normally, if you want to change the font size, you have to select that stuff and then go to a box somewhere else and then, then increase the font size there. Then here it's just mapped to a, a visual doodad, so you can. It's very easy to to resize things. Uh, if you want to move things around, there's just a handle right on the edge. If you want to rotate things, uh, you just grab a handle and rotate it. Uh, and there's also the question of left, right, center justification, uh, which normally is uh, again left, right, and center, which always seem very restrictive to me. Um, so you can do just the left, right, and center, but you can also just hold down the modifier and do any sort of thing in between, which again is very useful if you wanted to adapt it to animation. <coughs> I cannot do flowed text boxes quite yet. Uh, I have plans for like scrib scribus type of flowed text boxes, but uh, debugging those things is kind of a nightmare. Fonts are like so complicated. Uh, libraries like HarfBuzz simplify a lot of things, but they end up still being, it's like a, a huge mass of work that you have to sort through in a lot of special cases. And it's, I wouldn't call that fun. It sort of is because there's the visual elements to letters, but then it's very easy to get bogged down in font processing. Uh, one thing that is uh, using letters in kind of unusual ways is uh, text on paths. Um, so this also has visual doodads just for, for changing the, the offset on a path. Sometimes it's kind of hard to figure out how to make things uh, just like where you want on the path or uh, offset from the path. And you can also use an envelope of the path for the size of text here. as 
paths in laid out are variable width, so you can change uh, just on the fly uh, path thicknesses. On home, at my computer at home, all these uh, the control handles and stuff stand out a lot more. I've noticed that on my on my laptop here, it's harder to see the little marks. Something to add to my to-do list to differentiate the control things a little better. Uh, by the way, these uh, the, these width handles, uh, I have an exporter for paths that uses the that you can export to SVG using the Inkscape Power Stroke, uh, which allows uh, variable width paths. So it's basically equivalent. Uh, however, this in here in paths you can change the the angle along the stroke as well as the the size. And uh, one fresh tool I've been working on is a node-based interface. Uh, speaking of animation, you can sort of get some animation just by tinkering around with nodes. Uh, like Blender, for instance, has a, a pretty thorough node-based system, uh, or at least if you have extra add-ons like the uh, animation nodes for Blender, you can do all, all kinds of weird stuff with it. Uh, let's see. Nodes are kind of an uneasy alliance between visual, like what artists expect to manipulate visually and what programmers want to manipulate. Uh, so it's, I've been trying to think of like what's, what are some new ways or slightly obscure ways perhaps to, to deal with big node systems. Uh, one big problem with node systems is that sometimes they end up being this huge massive spaghetti and it's like if you leave it for a couple of weeks and then come back or, or you, you download something, you're trying to figure out what was going on. It's very difficult to decipher what was going on. So uh, I've, I've made some like little interface tricks to, to follow lines to see where they go. Uh, so if lines get hidden, all you have to do is click on it and figure out where they go. Uh, and so I've also, for nodes, have been using uh, Geggle nodes based on libgeggle, which is kind of the, the back end for GIMP, <coughs> GIMP now. Uh, internally, Geggle is uh, non-destructive node-based editing, but it's all in C. Uh, you can do a lot with it, uh, and it happens to be very easy to map to a user interface, uh, kind of shockingly easy. It's like most libraries uh, do not allow you to use them except with this, this tangled mass of glue code, but it's, it's, it's remarkably easy to, to map things in with Geggle. So for instance, this thing, uh, just by tying one value to a file name and to some other math that controls a gradient, for instance, uh, just by sliding a, one thing around, you can, you can make things kind of pulse. And uh, Gaggle nodes can, if the image is really big, it takes a lot of time for to run things. Uh, so there's an option to either auto save as you change things. So like if this was checked and I changed that value, every single time it changed, uh, this Gaggle save node would save something every single time to a disk. Uh, so it's not necessarily what you want, uh, but once you have things set up, then you can do that. Uh, now let's say I wanted to animate this pulse. Uh, instead of just a value, you'd want a loop. Um, so I can add a loop here if it comes up. So if I want this loop to start at zero, end at say 360 in steps of 10, if I tie that to the file name, and I tie that to uh, this math stuff that's just take, basically is taking the value and making a sine wave out of it. So the, you have this gradient that's going to pulse as the loop goes on. And I need something to drive that loop. All right. 
right, so now uh, I have a loop tied into that, so uh, I can step through it one at a time. Then, for some reason, when Geggle nodes kind of behave peculiarly, I, I wouldn't say I fully understand everything that's going on. It's actually saving, but for some reason, once you put up something that it can actually save to, it no longer will show what it's saving. Not quite sure what's going on with that. Uh, but it is actually saving. So if it goes through all of these loops. So now, so now those things are all there. So that's how you can use a node tool with Geggle nodes in my obscure laid out program to make animated GIFs. And Geggle has all kinds of weird nodes to play around with. Uh, there's like hundreds of stuff that you can do with it. It's yet one more tool that uh, I haven't actually made actual artwork with, but it's fun to play around with these things. So Giggle has gradients and fractal explorers and all kinds of compositors. Uh, and also with this tool, uh, there's nodes are really popular in graphics editing. Like there's Substance Painter and Houdini for proprietary stuff. There's Blender. The uh, fairly new open source game engine Godot uses nodes. Uh, so I, my thinking is if I have a node system, that's easy to, it might be easy to import and export these things to different systems. For instance, all these ones built out of Geggle nodes, uh, these can all be exported to Geggle XML. So you could build something in here and then potentially use it in other places. And that also goes for uh, SVG filters, which I guess the next talk is going to be about SVG filters. Uh, so here, I have an importer that will import SVG filters. Takes a while. So this is a this is from the uh, Inkscape's gigantic filter file, which defines all kinds of different. Uh, filters you can use. Uh, right now, I just have an importer. I can't actually export yet. Uh, I was hoping to have that by today, but just didn't quite get there. So now it's fairly easy to, to just import an SVG filter. You can tinker around with nodes and at least in a week or so maybe export the filter again. Uh, and SVG filters are also fairly easy to map to Geggle nodes uh, for the most part. Uh, so potentially, you could use laid out to translate between SVG filters and Giggle nodes. So you could use something from uh, SVG, use it in GIMP, or take something from GIMP and use it in Inkscape, uh, or, obs or obscure weird stuff like laid out. And nodes are kind of a are kind of a rabbit hole to go down because there's so many things you can do with them, uh, but they end up being very useful in different circumstances. For my engraver tool. That was when I first started working on a node tool, because the engraver tool has, when you layer stuff, you can trace images from it uh, to control line thickness or colors or whatnot. Uh, but sometimes you want to use the same trace object for different layers of these masses of lines. Like it's, if you have crisscrossing lines, you want to use the same trace image. But uh, in this one block that I had set up for them, uh, oops. No, I don't want shortcuts. So this kind of very dense block of stuff, uh, it's possible to, to assign different tracing objects, but it's, it's really cumbersome and it's kind of annoying. But with nodes, uh, you're just taking visual blocks and like putting them together like Legos. It's much easier to configure things. So as time goes on, nodes will be more implemented or like more connected to stuff and laid out like for object uh, object filters. Uh, the Inkscape 
SVG filters, for instance, only work on raster, but Inkscape also has path effects, which operate on, uh, on vectors. So uh, different vector paths, you can run a, a path effect and then twist things around. Uh, but it would be nice to have both of those things unified into a single interface, which is what I'm trying to do ultimately with nodes and objects here. Let's see. One other even more obscure tool that I was working on is a 3D unwrapper. Uh, one of my other hobbies is to do panoramic photography, uh, which takes uh, spherical photos all around uh, an area. So for instance, uh, you take a, some kind of spherical image, and then it's fun to, to make little balls uh, with that image projected onto it. Uh, I always like to use computers to make something, do something that's hard to do in real life, and then ultimately end up with a physical object, be it a book or a, like a ball. Like there's the famous Escher print where he's holding a, a mirror ball, and you can see him in it. So it's basically as if you're holding one of those things, but using a spherical image to map to it. Thought I had this ready to go already. Live demonstration, folks. It's the greatest. Um, so this is a tool that uh, lets you unwrap things. Why is it not letting me rotate? There it is. You can also use this tool to feed in weird layouts into Laidout. Uh, Laidout does not let you, or it lets you uh, do layout into book formats, but you can also import just nets of things. So for instance, a, a cube, uh, you can just unwrap like that. So you could e export that layout to use in Laidout to import images uh, so that you could just print out a, a ball or whatnot. Load images control I for some weird reason. Okay, so now here's the, the image. Uh, sometimes I'm kind of lazy with the programming, so I haven't debugged the, the right on the edge of this in OpenGL displays. Uh, so now once you have an image, then you can uh, map the texture and move it around, kind of squish things around, so you can uh, lay out images just how you want on shapes. And it doesn't have to be a cube, too. It could be anything you can make in an OBJ format you that you can import, and then the software will... Uh, kind of squish things around. See, that's actually most of what I wanted to demonstrate. Uh, 
you know, these are some of the, the more uh, developed uses for the engraver tool, for instance, so like uh, tracing uh, masses of lines. Uh, you can put in open simplex based noise fields so that it's not totally random, it's just like a, a field of squishiness. Uh, or radial patterns that get severe randomness to it. Or line profiles, so you just define a field of lines and then uh, you can customize uh, how the lines automatically get structured. And in the future, perhaps that'll be the layout for, for open source layout tools, but might be a while. <coughs> and, and that's all I've got. I don't know if there's any questions or anything, but I'm happy to answer. Yeah, I was just wondering uh, how many of the tools that you were playing with are tied into the graphical interface and how many, like it looked like you were bouncing between different things. When I go and download laid out, how much of that can I actually play with right now? I, well, if you manage to compile and install laid out, then everything is pretty much uh, just visual tinkering. So it should everything be ready to go. How soon can a stupid person like me use it? <laughs> uh, it should be fairly straightforward. I mean, I've tried to make the compile process easy. Uh, so anytime you have to compile something, that's some, for some people that's by definition not easy. But once it's installed, uh, it should just be fairly straightforward. I try to minimize the number of buttons you have to press to do things. Uh, so there's like one button to import images, one button to export stuff, uh, you select a tool, then the tool has different visual things to indicate wh where you actually are. And most things have mouse overs, so if there's like some weird uh, visual doodad that you have no idea what to do with. If you just hover over something, it'll like change color or something, and a little message will display down below saying what'll happen theoretically if you drag it around. So mainly it's just, it's set up so that you can just drag things around and play with it. I hope, that's my goal. <laughs> Any other questions for Tom? How, how is the support for spanning images across pages? Uh, I have a, let's see, I know I can do that. I haven't tried to do that in a while. Can I remember how to do that? Let's see, there's a, I have a, a paper interface. So it, uh, if you want to span, something across multiple pages. Uh, so like here you can see this dotted line of a page. Um, so that's one page and then you can just paper things across however you like. And then export that as either to Scribe as documents or to SVG or PDFs with varying degrees of success. SVG is the, the best one. Scribus is hit or miss kind of. It's mostly pretty good. Uh, yeah, then it'll divide everything up just on that paper layout. Right. I use this uh, the paper tool like this. Uh, I made a T-shirt with a panoramic image projected onto it. Um, so I I use this to divide it up into iron iron-on sheets. So one T-shirt. If anyone wants to know, is like uh, 20 different iron-on sheets. <laughs> so the shirt itself ends up being really stiff. So I wouldn't recommend that method of like T-shirt creation. But. Any other questions for Tom? What operating systems is it compatible with? Um, right now, it's only in Linux. <laughs> I, I have a, I have one dual booting system that has Windows 10, and with Windows 10, you can install like basically a, a full functioning Ubuntu system, and it almost works there. Uh, for some reason, it's, it doesn't do double buffering. I haven't quite figured that out, and it won't let me expand my windows. It's another obscure bug I haven't quite figured out. So as long as you, if you don't mind windows that are like one quarter of the screen, uh, then it works just fine in windows. 
it should work on Macs, but I don't have a Mac to test it on. All right, but running under X11. Any other questions? And where can we get it to go play with it? Uh, and where's the source? It's uh, laidout.org is the site, uh, and the source code is on GitHub. Are any other artists using this yet? Um, I've known a few people who have used it to make little booklets. Uh, and some people have some, uh, even by my standards, pretty obscure requests to do strange layout things. And sometimes I've been able to do it, and sometimes not. Uh, like uh, one feature, for instance, is uh, you have a sheet of paper, and you want to cut it up and make a book. Uh, but uh, when you divide it into signatures in my current editor, you can only fold entire sheets down into one thing, but the person wanted to take a piece of paper and then have it so, like, so you end up printing 50 sheets of paper and then cut it down the middle and then take one stack and then put it physically on top of the other stack. Um, that's something I absolutely want to do. It seems like a, a very natural thing to want to do, especially for like really indie comics and booklets and things. But my current interface does not allow doing that. One of the many things on my to-do list. Any other? Yep. Are you open to packaging in any of the like new cross cross distro packaging formats, Flatpak or Snap or Snap Image? I'm definitely open to it. Uh, if someone wants to help me do that, that would be great. But I uh, I love working on the interface and working out little interface quirks. But like the the nuts and bolts of packaging or porting to Windows, for instance, it's, those are are not all that exciting to me. Like in terms of getting users, it's important, but so I'm definitely open to it in that way. But actually sitting down and doing it, I can't help you with that, but I can help you with like a flat pack or a snap or something. All right, yeah, we should talk about that. I was kind of curious, um, how does that Node editor that you were using different from the IBM tool, tool Node Red? Uh, I'm not familiar with Node Red. Uh, so I'm not really sure. Um, so I know there's all kinds of different node-based systems, uh, and some are like like very full-featured uh, flow-based programming environments. Uh, like this currently, even though it's there's a node that's called a thread, it's not a true thread in terms of processing. Uh, I might have actual threads at some point, but like some node systems, you can each node has inputs and outputs. Uh, and uh, before a node processes, you might wait until the inputs are ready, for instance. Uh, so there's not that level of control in these things. Right now, as soon as something changes, it propagates to the next node up that something needs to be changed. So and, and you wrote this program in C? Um, C++. Any other questions? Uh Uh, I have two questions. First, uh, trim marks. I didn't see them on there when you did the layout for the pages. Did this, do you add trim marks to it for the uh, printer? Yes. Um, so these, the red is cut marks, so you can uh, put these in and then drag them how you want. But those marks will actually show up for the printer on the printer spreads. What's that? The printer spreads with the, uh -huh. for the printer to see those marks will actually be there for them to see to trim and fold. Uh, let's see. I haven't used those in a while. I, there is some functions in here where you can do little registration marks or like a color bar. Okay. I, but the last time I tried to use that was a few months ago. And for some reason, uh, part of it was like not rendering properly. So theoretically, it's possible, but it might need some debugging. OK, and then does the program understand bleed, where the photo goes off the edge? Uh, well, you can, you can just drag things so that it, things just go off the edge. So in that sense, it does. Uh, at some point, the. The bleed is more a function of, of like rendering and what your physical paper is. 
So it just lets you define the physical paper and where the area you ultimately want is. So in that sense, it cares about bleed. Well, I understand, but it's like when you print a cover of a book, uh -huh. you want it to have an eighth of an inch bleed all the way around, and right. then, but you want the marks to be inside that eighth of an inch so it gets cut through. Uh -huh. Would uh, that be doable? Yes. Uh, so like here you have gaps. Um, so when you're uh, editing in the page edit view, so, yeah, so that's papers. Uh, so if you put in objects and they don't automatically fall on an actual page, then they'll fall on the paper. So those objects will fit in the paper. Uh, I don't think I have it so it automatically puts like cut lines that you can see. Uh, that's, uh, I know that's on my to-do list, but I never got quite got, got around to implementing it. Oops, unless it crashes like that. <laughs> All right, thank you. Any other questions for Tom? Oh, we have one. Yeah, for that example with the spiral, was that the tiling tool? Um, I, I, I just wanted to clarify that. Yes, that was the clone tiler. Any others? Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you.